Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, welcome to our service of worship. Y'all have um, survived the rain and the cold to come in, so um, um, you get an extra a star in your crown today. And, um, and that reminds me that our first announcement this morning is that we're all going to take a nap when we're done with worship today. <laughs> Um, and just uh, sleep through the rain. That'll be, that'd be a nice way to spend it, right? Yeah, all right, going to get an amen. Um, okay, um, want to let you know, Pastor David's not with us today. He is with our senior highs who are skiing at Snowshoe, West Virginia today. We have a group of uh, 50 that have gone to Snowshoe and so, um, so anyway, so I hope that everybody ha- um, stays safe and has a great time up there. Um, and uh, Pastor David is chaperoning that group, so pray for him too. All right, um, next Sunday, I want to make sure that you make plans to come a little early. It's the fifth Sunday of the month. That means we're having breakfast upstairs. So mark that on your calendar. We'll have breakfast upstairs before the service starts. So come in a little bit early next week. Um, And speaking of food, on February 12th, we'll have our annual chili and chowder cook-off, and you can see your self-nomination form is the yellow sheet that's in the bulletin. Um, We're looking for the best chili and best chowders in the church, and so hope that you will participate this year. Again, that's February 12th, also known as Super Bowl Sunday. And then uh, last but not least, this Thursday at 6 o'clock is our Stirred Not Shaken Fellowship um, group, and that's for folks that are um, kind of youngish adults, folks are 30s, 40s, uh, 50s, you know, you got kids um, or not kids, it doesn't matter, Um, but uh, we're getting together uh, later this week, Thursday at 6, hope that you will um, put that on your calendar and uh, make time to uh, get to know some other folks in that same age bracket. And so that's all the announcements I have today, other than the fact that you're in for a real treat with Julia's sermon. It's fabulous. So, uh, so anyway, let's now continue to worship the Lord our God.
has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing. Praise for the morning. Praise for them springing fresh from the word. join me in the congregational prayer that is printed in your bulletin. God of hope, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, you taught us that the worst thing is never the last thing. Help us to trust in you even when we can't see you working. In the sure and certain hope of your love, we offer ourselves to you. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn is number 154 in the hymnal. It's All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let's stand and sing together.
continue to stand as you are able as we affirm our belief and our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed, which is found printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. taking your seat, I invite you to turn to your neighbor and greet them in the name of Jesus Christ. Here to read Psalm 121, our psalm for January, is Dagna Gilbert. Lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will, not, will ne, nev, neither sleep nor slumber. Sl, n, 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 oh my God. <laughs> will, never, will never slumber or, nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your sh shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm, and he will watch over your life. The Lord will not watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Dagny. And now I'd like to invite Charlie and Tricia Williams to come forward as uh, they're going to be joining our church. Everyone else, if you'll turn to the insert that's in your bulletin as we welcome our newest members. I told them they had to prepare a speech, but the speech is simply, I will. Um, so I do have a couple of questions to ask in order to make it official. As members of Christ Universal Church, we be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries. If so, your answer is, I will. As members of this congregation here at Wrightsville United Methodist, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, again, your answer is, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Church, we give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. 
And so, we welcome you. It's so great to have you. Why don't we give them a big hand? And please notice that Charlie and Tricia are sitting back here in the back. So on your way out, before you shake our hands, shake their hands and introduce yourself and make them feel right here at home. Um, it's so great to have Charlie and Tricia as our newest members here. If you are thinking, um, you know, I might like to be a, a member here at this church, our next new member class will take place on Saturday, February 11th, and you can sign up on the new member board right out here in the hallway. So if you're thinking, you know, I, I might like to do that, um, then come and join us and, and be a part of that new member class on February 11th. Thanks. <laughs> Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation so where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? for my soul being a friend to help me in the end where could I go but to the Lord neighbors are kind I love them everyone we get along in sweet accord but when my soul needs manna from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. to prayer. And uh, again, I want to just uh, lift up our senior highs that are on that ski trip. Um, pray not only for um, safety while they're skiing, but safety coming and going, and um, that everybody will have a great time, uh, but also that they will be touched spiritually as well this weekend. 
Um, also want to lift up a, a couple of other prayer concerns. Uh, yesterday we had the funeral for Doug Buhite, so continue to lift up the Buhite family in your prayers. And uh, David Worsley passed away um, this past Friday, and so we uh, lift up uh, Susan Salem's family um, as uh, in the loss of her father. Um, let's turn to God in prayer. God of covenant and promise, we want to be a people of peace. We want to be a people of healing. We want to be a people of reconciliation. Yet we know how we often fall short of what you would have us be. Be patient, just as a potter reshapes a vessel. And teach us to be patient and forgiving with others around us. You call us to reflect your grace and generosity, yet we know we often fail to live up to our call as disciples. Help us see with fresh eyes your image in each and every one we meet. We recognize, O oh God, that you have blessed everyone with skills and talents, abilities and opportunities to minister. So help us to use those gifts for service here in our congregation, in our neighborhood, and throughout the Cape Fear region, wherever and whenever we have the opportunity. And in places where we may not be gifted, and we feel hopeless and discouraged. Lift us up and remind us that you will still hold us close to your very heart. In places where we don't seem to be able to bring about the change you call us to bring in the world, we ask that you'll bring us alongside others and lift our spirits for the hard work ahead. And we ask especially that you'll come alongside those whom we know and love that are having a hard time in this very moment including those that we name out loud or in our hearts. And now, O oh God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are assured of your great love for us. And so we renew our commitment to follow Jesus the Christ. Thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward to receive God's tithes and our offerings.
may be seated. And I'd like to ask the children to come forward and meet me for the children's time. We got any kids here? Come on down. Hello, hello. Y'all can come on around. Come on. Yeah, hey there. Good group. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Hope everybody's doing well. You, uh, you survived the rain and, and got to church today. Well done, well done. Does anybody know what a pop quiz is? What's a pop quiz? It comes up randomly, right. It's a test that you didn't know you were going to have, right? Well, we're going to have one of those. We're going to start with a pop quiz. Don't freak out. It's okay. It's okay. Nobody's going to be graded, all right? But um, I'm going to go ahead and warn you, it's a really, really hard test. It's really hard. I'm not, I'm not really expecting everybody to get all the answers, okay? All right, so here's the first question. Some might get it and some might not. If you don't, it's okay, all right? You ready? You think so? Okay. The first question is, what is 20 times 20? Anybody know? Yeah? 400. 400. Well done. Well done. Did everybody know that? Yeah. Everybody knew that? Okay, good, good. All right, here's the next one. What is the 20th book of the Bible? Anybody out there know that one? Dagny's going to go look it up. I love that. Great. Yes. If I, don't know, if I don't know the answer, I will go find it. It's an open book test. There we go. What is it? That's, that spells Proverbs. That's right. The book of Proverbs. Well done. Well done. All right. Um, and then thirdly, okay, last question. Where will you be in 20 years? What will you be doing? What do you think? College. 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 That's a good answer. Good answer. Very well could be. Right? What might you be doing? What do you think you'll be doing? What do you want to be when you grow up? Hmm? Probably babysitting, okay, all right, that's good, yeah, uh-huh, you'll be 30, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, we don't know, right, we don't know, we don't know what we'll be doing in 20 years. Well, I want to tell you today about a man named Jeremiah, can you say Jeremiah? Jeremiah, Jeremiah that's right, Jeremiah was a prophet, and God asked him to be a prophet when he was just a kid. And so Jeremiah told God, he said, I don't know how to be a prophet. I don't have all the answers, and I, I don't know what to say to all the people. And God told Jeremiah, don't worry about it. I will give you the knowledge. I will tell you what to say. If I've asked you to do something, I'll give you what you need in order to get it done. Okay? So Jeremiah was like, okay, well, if that's the case... Then, then, I'm, then I'm on board. I'm on board. So I want you all to think about that too. That I suspect there's going to be a time when God is going to ask you to do something. And don't freak out. Don't get scared. Don't think, I, I can't do it. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the right words. I don't have the right abilities. God will give you what you need in order to accomplish what God wants done. He will give you the words. He will give you the abilities. He will give you the right thing to say, just like he did for Jeremiah, the prophet, long, long ago when he was just a child himself. So sometimes we don't think we have all the answers. That's okay. If God wants us to accomplish something, God will give us what we need. And that's what I want you to think about as you go through this week. Okay? Let's have a prayer. Holy God, thank you for using us to help you. And Lord, where we feel like we don't have what it takes, give us the knowledge that we need, the wisdom that we need,
the words that we need to say on your behalf. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. I hope you all have a super duper week. Thank you all. You all did so great on that test. Wow. Pastor Doug for getting us started on Jeremiah and giving us some very helpful background information. Very grateful for that. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to bring you our scripture lesson for today and our message. Um, we are in the midst of a sermon series called A Sure and Certain Hope, where we are looking at passages and stories throughout the Bible that tell us something about hope. And um, as Doug alluded to, our passage today comes to us from Jeremiah. Um, we're going to be in chapter 32, if you want to turn there and join in. I'm going to be starting at verse 6. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anatoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anatoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anatoth from my cousin Hanamel, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver, I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy and loving God, we are longing today to hear a word from you. Lord, I ask that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. God, I pray that anything that I say that isn't from you, let it be instantly forgotten. But anything I say that is from you, Lord, let it root deeply into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As a pastor, I know that every congregation is unique. Every congregation has something about them that makes them special. Well, after being here for about a year and a half, I think that I've determined at least one thing that really defines Wrightsville United Methodist Church as a congregation. This congregation is filled with real estate agents. <laughs> uh, genuinely, I think there are more real estate agents in this congregation than I knew existed in the entire state of North Carolina. Um, in fact, if, if you are a real estate agent or you are directly related to a real estate agent, would you raise your hand just as, as, yeah, okay, that's actually a smaller group than we had in the first service. There are so many real estate agents. Well, I'm glad for this today because our passage is essentially about a real estate deal. But as you heard, this is a pretty strange deal. In our passage today, we hear from Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet who lives in the 6th century BC. 
Now, the job of a prophet is more than just predicting the future, even though that is what we typically think about when we think of prophets. The role of a prophet is to be called by God to speak to God's people to get God's people back on track, back to listening to God's word and doing all that God commanded them. At this point in our story, it's been 40 years since Jeremiah received his call and his first vision from God. And all along, he has been warning the people over and over and over, if you keep doing what you are doing, there will be consequences. If you keep worshiping gods other than our God and keep practicing injustice instead of righteousness, then we'll be taken over by Babylon. He has shared this message over and over and over again with all the people through the reign of multiple kings, King Josiah, King Jehoiakim, and now King Zedekiah. Now, what Jeremiah warned about is actually happening. Jerusalem, this holy capital city, is under siege. And Jeremiah is watching all of this happen from prison, where he's been put because he warned the king this was going to happen, and the king did not want to hear it. It's here, sitting in prison, that Jeremiah receives a vision telling him to expect for his cousin to pay him a visit. It all happens exactly as God said that it would. Jeremiah's cousin, Hanamel, comes to Jeremiah and asks him to buy a piece of land. Specifically, he says, buy my field that is an anatoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Here he's referencing a law in the Old Testament that God gave the people that said that if someone has a piece of land and then falls on hard times, he can go to his next of kin and ask that person to buy the land from him. The idea was that you'd be able to keep land inside the family and preserve the family legacy even if an individual wasn't able to continue to own that land. Well, knowing that our congregation is full of real estate agents, I decided that um, I would talk to one of our resident experts about this uh, potential real estate deal. I wanted to know, is this a good investment opportunity for Jeremiah? So I spoke to one of the real estate agents in our own congregation about how to determine if a property is a good investment. She said that the first thing you need to do is think about the area surrounding the property. Is the area in decline or are people moving there? Is it, is it increasing? Then you also have to think about factors like the crime rate. Is this a safe place to be? And if it's a piece of land, you want to make sure that you think about environmental factors. You know, is this somewhere that's going to flood a lot? Is there a factory nearby that's going to cause pollution? Overall, is this somewhere that people would like to live? Well, at, my end, at the end of the conversation that I had with this real estate agent, I said, okay, I got one more question for you. If you had a client who was interested in purchasing a piece of land that was in the center of a war zone, how would you advise them? And she thought about it for a moment and then very calmly and carefully said, I would advise against it and I would get that in writing. By all accounts, this is a terrible investment. The field is in Anatoth, which is just about three miles northeast of Jerusalem, which is actively under siege. People are not moving into the neighborhood, they are fleeing from the neighborhood. And things are only going to get worse. At this point, it's becoming clear to everyone that the Babylonians are going to win. And they're going to take control of Jerusalem. At best, the Israelites might be able to continue living in their land, but with the Babylonians as an occupying force. At worst, they'll be exiled to Babylon, 
and will have to leave everything that they know and love behind. This is no time to be investing in land. So why does Jeremiah do it? Simply put, Jeremiah goes through with the sale because God told him to. After he buys the field, Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall once again be bought in this land. This act, buying a field in the middle of a war, is an act of hope. Buying land is a way of planning for the future. And you only plan for the future if you believe you have a future. I recently read a story about a school system that had a program that helped hospitalized kids keep up with their schoolwork. One day, one of the teachers in the program got a call to speak with a particular child, and so she went to this child's teacher and found out what they were learning about. Turns out, at this point, they were learning about nouns and adverbs. Well, the teacher went to the, see this boy that very afternoon, but no one had warned her for the reason why this little boy was in the hospital. When she got there, she found out that the boy had been burned very, very badly and that he was in terrible pain. She felt really sheepish, almost embarrassed about what she had come there to do, but she still came in and said, well, I'm here to help you with your nouns and adverbs. She left that day feeling like she had accomplished nothing except for maybe making this poor kid feel worse. The next day she's back at the hospital and a nurse comes, fi comes and finds her and says, what did you do to that boy? Well, thinking that she had done something wrong, she starts apologizing, but the nurse says, no, 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 you don't understand. We've been worried sick about that boy. But after yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's, it's like he's decided he wants to live. Later on, the boy explained that he'd just about given up hope. And then the teacher arrived. Everything changed when he came to a simple realization. He said it this way. They wouldn't send a teacher to teach nouns and adverbs to a dying boy. You only plan for the future if you believe you have a future. Hope means believing you have a future. When Jeremiah buys the field, he is saying that he believes that Israel has a future. He believes Israel has hope. But Jeremiah's hope is more than pure intellectual assent. This means putting down his own very real money. It means spending real money to buy worthless land in front of a public audience. He's using all of his own resources to put into this hope. What's fascinating to me is that after this, after he takes this extraordinary, risky public action, we find out that Jeremiah's hope wasn't actually as sure as it seemed to be. Right after our passage end, Jeremiah continues in verse 16. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God! That's the same way that all of the great psalms of lament begin. Then he goes on in his prayer detailing all of God's mighty acts throughout history, leading up to this threat that if Israel didn't change their ways, there would be punishment. And then the fact that that punishment is clearly happening before Jeremiah's eyes. He cries out to God, See, the siege ramps have been cast up against the city to take it. And the city, faced with sword, famine, and pestilence, has been given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke has happened, as you yourself can see. Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses. 
though the city has been given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Jeremiah brought all of his fear and all of his confusion before God. And in what follows, God comforts Jeremiah and explains the plan. Yes, the people of Israel will be marched out of Jerusalem in chains and led into a foreign land. But that isn't the end of the story. God is still giving Israel a hope and a future. God says this, I will rejoice in doing good to them, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. I will rejoice in doing good to them. By listening in on this interaction between God and Jeremiah, we get to listen in and find out about God's beautiful, stunning promises of love. But we also find out something very interesting. Before Jeremiah understood the plan, he acted in hope. Before Jeremiah felt hopeful, he acted hopeful. Hope is acting as if the promises of God are true. Notice I didn't say hope is believing the promises of God are true. More than our feelings, hope is shown in our behavior. You don't need to believe it. You just need to act like you do. Last week, Pastor Doug talked about how hard it can be for us to believe that we are truly forgiven and accepted by God. Well, a lot of people feel that way at one time or another, including John Wesley, who was the founder of Methodism. He struggled to believe in salvation through faith alone. You see, John Wesley was really committed to holy living, to growing in holiness by right action. And so it was difficult for him to believe that without all of that piety, God would still love him. But he wanted to believe that, so he went to a trusted mentor named Peter Bowler, and he asked if he should stop preaching until he believed better. Bowler responded, preach faith till you have it, and then, because you have it, you will preach faith. Well, this is just what Wesley needed to hear. He writes this as his next journal entry. Accordingly, I began practicing this new doctrine, though my soul started back from the work. The first person to whom I offered salvation by faith alone was a prisoner under sentence of death. His name was Clifford. Peter Bowler had many times desired me to speak to him before, but I could not prevail on myself to do so being still, as I had been many years, a zealous asserter of the impossibility of deathbed repentance. Although he wanted to believe it, Wesley didn't believe that he or others could be saved through faith alone without their holiness. But instead of waiting around until he suddenly believed differently, he just started acting as if he believed it. Wesley says right there that previously he couldn't prevail on himself to offer God's gift of salvation to this convicted criminal because Wesley didn't agree with deathbed repentance. In other words, Wesley didn't believe that he could go and offer the gift of salvation to this dying criminal because he didn't believe that you could just ask forgiveness from Jesus at the last minute, and then make up for a whole life of sin. In visiting this prisoner and preaching the gospel of grace to him, Wesley was acting as if he believed faith was all that God requires. And in doing so, Wesley was practicing hope. Hope is acting as if the promises of God are true. There's a great principle I've heard that says you can't 
think your way into right action. You can only act your way into right thinking. This is never more true than in our faith journeys. We will never have enough faith or hope in our heads to just wake up one day and start taking risks and trusting God. The only way to begin to hope in God is to pretend like you already do. I want you to take a moment here with me now and think about what is going on in your life. What is bringing you the most anxiety? What situations are keeping you up in the middle of the night? As you think about these places, I want you to ask yourself, how would you act if you believed that God promises to rejoice in doing good to you? That's the promise God gave to Jeremiah, that even though exile was unavoidable, God's ultimate plan was still to rejoice in doing good to his people. How would you parent if you believed that it was God's promise to rejoice in doing good to you? What business decisions would you make if you believed God promised to rejoice in doing good to you? What, how would your relationships change if you believed that God promised to rejoice in doing good to you? How would you spend your time if you believed God promised to rejoice in doing good to you? Once you have an answer to that, act like it. You don't have to believe it yet. Just act like it's true. Hope is acting as if the promises of God are true. And truly, we have a hope because the promises of God are sure and certain. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you that you have promised to rejoice in doing good to us. Lord, thank you that you don't just do good to us begrudgingly, but that it gives you delight, just like it gives us delight to give gifts to our children. Lord, help us to believe that you will rejoice in doing good to us. And even before we believe it, Lord, help us to act like we do. Lord, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand and join together in our closing hymn number 368.
you walk if you believed what you were about to step onto was Christ the solid rock? <laughs> Go today as people who know that hope just means acting as if the promises of God are true. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ, our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. Until we meet again.